Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Tessa Keough, and on behalf of the Guild of One Name Studies, welcome to our pre-recorded session for the eighth webinar in our Seven Pillars webinar series. We host this monthly webinar series on the third Tuesday of the month, and more information about the topics as well as registration links for the remaining webinars can be found at the Guild website. Our topic today is Six Months In with a New Study, with Guild members Melanie Caldicott and Karen Heenan Davis. Now we have a bit of a twist as Melanie's son was in a school production, and since she couldn't be in two places at once, we pre-recorded her presentation. We originally planned to include a recording within the live session, but we found content-wise and timing-wise, Melanie's presentation stands on its own. Melanie Caldicott has been a member of the Guild since 2017, and she has two registered studies, one for the Caldicott surname and one for the Measures surname. Melanie started her Caldicott study in 2017 and has already set up a website using the Guild-hosted Members Website Project, and both the layout and the substance of her website is amazing. For those of you looking for some inspiration as you make decisions on your own blogs and websites, take a look at Melanie's visually stunning and quite inviting website. Melanie is a member of the UK Warwickshire region. She's a librarian assistant, so there's no getting away from research resources for her. She's married and mum to three children, one of whom was in that school production. Melanie's profile for her Caldicott One Name study is posted at the Guild website, and you can learn a bit more about her study and find links to her website as well as contact information at the Caldicott profile. Melanie's Measures One Name study is still in its infancy, and we'll just have to wait to learn more about it once she publishes a profile. Melanie's Guild-hosted TNG website Caldicott One Name Study is an example of placing your TNG database on the back end of your website. Melanie designed the front end using WordPress and it can be found at caldicott.one-name.net. We're going to take a quick look at just a few items that I wanted to point out. Melanie focuses on posts to engage her audience, and that's done by the use of biographies, telling the stories of people in her study, and memorials, using topics such as war memorials to those people in her study who served and died in specific wars. Now, in both instances, Melanie makes great use of a strong image to draw the viewer in to learn more. Along the right-hand side of her website, Melanie includes several ways for a person to learn more. An invitation to encourage anyone with an interest in the Caldicott surname to join her Facebook group. A call to action with a simple method for viewers to subscribe. Contact information for viewers to use to share their knowledge, whether it's stories, family tree information, or questions about her research. A search box and images with past popular posts completes her home or landing page. As I mentioned, Melanie's TNG database is nestled in her website, and the drop-down menu takes the viewer to all the features of the TNG database to search for Caldicott's currently in Melanie's study. Finally, Melanie's closed Facebook group for her Caldicott One Name study is a great way on social media to encourage discussion and sharing among those who have the surname and or are researching family members with the surname. If Melanie's presentation raises questions not answered during the session, please post your questions at the Guild's Facebook page and we'll be sure to follow up with Melanie and get your questions answered. And with that, let's get started by turning over the controls to Melanie Caldicott. Welcome, Melanie. Great. Well, um, a few months, a few weeks ago, Julie Goucher rang me up and asked me if I would like to do one of the Guild webinars, which was quite a surprise. I've watched most of the webinars that have been happening during 2018 and very much enjoyed them and really appreciated the experience and tips that uh, the Guild members have been able to offer. So I was slightly daunted, but knowing that it was um, a a webinar that was particularly aimed at newbie goons, I thought, well, I might be able to give it a go. Now, 
obviously the webinar is called Six Months In With A New Study. I've actually been doing my one name study for about 18 months now. So it's a bit of a loose title for our webinar today, but I've probably upped my game, particularly during 2018. So I can still really identify with what it's like to be starting a study and how the evolution happens while a study is new. So I have two studies. The first one is Caldecott, which is my married name. And um, I started that back in 2017. And I suppose like most people, it sort of began with my own, my husband's family history and just realizing that actually the name was slightly unusual, um, although not as unusual as I would like. Now I'm into my study, I realize how many of us there are. But, and I, I wanted to find out more about it. So, you know, became familiar with what the Guild did and thought this would be a great thing to do. My, my study is small to medium. Like I say, it's, it's turned out to be larger than I originally expected. I think I weighed up the parameters for Caldecott itself, but didn't really take any of the variants into account. So some of the variants, Caldecott is the main surname, but some of the variants are almost as large. So it has turned out to be rather more than I expected, but that's okay. And it's a location-based surname. So Caldecott actually means cold in the cottage. And from what I can tell so far from my studies, it looks like it may be of multiple origins. Um, I think because it was kind of a nickname that could be a location surname that could be used in various places, um, it could have applied in different locations and therefore emanated and started in, in different places. It's mostly surrounding Warwickshire, Cheshire and Lancashire. Um, from what I can tell, there's a large number of Caldecotts with an I that come from Warwickshire and some of the other central counties like Worcestershire and Gloucestershire. And then Caldecott with an E certainly is more surrounding Cheshire and Lancashire. And there, are, there is a real difference there that was quite definable quite early on. These are all the variants that I've so far discovered. Some of these I have got from the Oxford Dictionary of Surnames from the Fan UK project, and some of them I've started to come across myself in my study. I had a very nice contact recently who I made through um, a Facebook forum, and she's now joined my own Facebook group, which is great. And her surname was Colkit, but she has been able to trace her pedigree back to Caldecott's. So that was a, a new variant that I hadn't come across until recently, which was a nice surprise. Then just recently this year, I did the Pharaoh's Beginners course in One Name Studies and um, really enjoyed the course. And as I was chatting on, in one of the chat rooms, I mentioned that my grandmother's maiden name was Measures. And uh, Julie, she's responsible for a lot of things, said, oh, that that sounds like quite an unusual name. That might be quite interesting to study. And um, I thought, oh, yes, it would be. Shall I do another one name study? Which was a little bit of a crazy thought. So I've registered it and um, have done a small amount of data collection. But um, I mostly have been concentrating my efforts still in Caldecott at the moment. Um, but I hope to maybe embark more on the measures journey shortly. So I started that this year, like I said, and again, it's another small to medium study and it's a nickname surname. So it may have been based on an occupation, but it actually may have been based just on other factors like somebody who was good at measuring or somebody who did measuring, um, not necessarily as their trade, but they were recognized in some way within their communities for doing that. And my own pedigree comes from Leicestershire, but there are a lot in the other eastern counties of Lincolnshire and Huntingdonshire. So I thought I would do my presentation based on the seven pillars, just because it, it is a structure that works. It's something that I took on board as a structure for my study quite early on, and um, it just gives us some broad areas to look at. So for data collection, when I started my one name study back in 2017, I approached it very much like my own family history. Now, I'm, I tend to be a person who 
works with a lot of detail. I like to be quite methodical um, and quite thorough in what I do. So although I was aware that a lot of one name studies are built around data collection that is done through scraping, I didn't really feel like I wanted to just kind of breeze through masses of data and not really pay any attention to the individual people. So I started creating spreadsheets, but I was manually entering in the data and then I would enter in a record for one individual and then I would enter it into my family history software at the same time. The family history software that I use is Heredis, um, which is a European software package. It's not as well known as some of the main ones, but as a Mac user, I was limited to what I could use anyway, because some of the packages aren't available on a Mac. And I, I've kind of worked my way through most family history software programs and liked Heredis, particularly because of the input in that was quite fast. Um, so for a one name study, when you're dealing with large amounts of data, I found this quite an advantage. Like I say, I was collecting data in spreadsheets. I preferred very much to be working in my family history software rather than the spreadsheets. For me, the spreadsheets are a bit of a dumping ground for my data, but I don't really use them to kind of work through the data or process it much. Um, there's certain information that I will draw from spreadsheets, but in terms of looking at individuals, I'm generally in my software, my family history software most of the time. I've always kept a research log. Up until recently, I did my, I used Heredis for my research log, and I would only log certain things. I felt that as I if I if I was adding a record, then that record spoke for itself. It was added as a fact, as an event, and therefore you could see that I had found the birth for this particular person. And, and I didn't really feel the need to therefore record that in my research log as well. However, so what I did record in my research log was more of the negative searches. So if I had looked for any articles in the British newspaper archive, for example, for somebody and come up with no results, then I would have recorded that. Or if I had looked on the GRO index for um, any children that may not have uh, appeared in census records because perhaps they died in infancy, then I would record that as well. But it wasn't so much I found the birth record for this person on this date. However, just the, in the last month, I have started using Evernote more. Um, I like Evernote a lot and wanted to use it more in my studies. Up until then, I had been only using it as like a web clipper, but I have started using it as my research log and hope to be more thorough in what I'm recording so that actually it is more useful to look back and see um, where I found particular records and when I added them. Now, I think a one name study is very much a process of evolution. So for me, it's been a journey. And like I said, at the start, when I began my one name study, I was very much approaching it like I was approaching my own family history. But I think in a way I was trapped by my old methods and I needed to adjust them really to get up to speed with the potential of a one name study and to be able to deal with the sheer quantity of data that we collect. So over the course of particularly 2018, I have adjusted what I do. And one of the things that led to that was watching the webinar that Paul Featherstone and Paul Howes did about data collection. And one thing that Paul Howes said really struck me. He said she, he was talking about using small data sets and the benefits that when we use a small data set, we can um, work it through to its completion and it's an easy win in a way. And whilst I didn't use that example directly, I did apply it because I started working through some of my smaller variants of the surname. I've spent most of my time dealing with Coldicott with an I or Coldicott with an E, which are two of the largest variants. But I was working through some of the smaller ones and was able to work through one that has only got a very tiny amount of data. So it took me a fortnight probably to collect just about every record that I could find on that particular variant of the surname, which was Corkut. And 
what I discovered from that was actually by seeing an aspect of my study from start to finish, it enabled me to see the benefits of what it's like to have a whole spreadsheet full of the data done very quickly and what you can gain from that. And so I started to adjust my thinking and thought that maybe actually there was benefit in data scraping the birth, marriages and deaths for all my variants and dumping them into spreadsheets. And then yes, taking my time to work through the individuals and adding to them, them to my family history software when I was good and ready. But to have that starting point and just think, well, I've covered all of those records and they're just there if anybody inquires about anybody that I haven't actually managed to get to as a focus yet. However, having said that, I am very much a person who's interested in the individuals and interested in family reconstruction. So I I'm uncertain at the moment as to how much data I just want to collect for collection's sake. I'm far more interested in building the pedigrees and working out people's lives um, and, and getting really into the nitty gritty events of their lives rather than just the, the raw data. Um, so I spend a lot of my time looking at newspaper articles and looking at some of the records that give me a little bit more of a flavor about who these people were. So I think for me, I will use spreadsheets for birth, marriages and deaths, and I will use them for all the census records. And I will probably scrape the information and dump those into the spreadsheets. But I may then deviate a lot more in the rest of my study, focusing on individuals and families. So for me, that was a real revelation. Like I said, it was a real moment when I heard Paul Howe say to focus on something small, and it really helped me adapt to my study. For example, in the 1881 census, there were 611 Caldicotts. But for the Corkut study that I was able to do that was really small, there were only 24. So you can see how beneficial that was to just kind of see that through to completion. And I would encourage any of you if you've got a lot of variants for your surname, to maybe just take a little bit of a break sometimes from the main variant of, of your surname and just you know go through one of either the deviants um, and work out how that family's spelling changed, or even just you know one of your smaller variants because it's a real benefit and gives you a real sort of sense of achievement which when we're in for the long haul, like we are in a one name study, that's quite a nice moment. Small is beautiful. And building a full pedigree is quite satisfying. Unfortunately, with the Corkut surname, it wasn't quite as complete a pedigree as I would have liked. And actually I've ended up with quite a lot of strays, um, which surprised me because it was so small. I thought I would be able to neatly fit them all together like a little jigsaw and, and that would be it. But it's not quite that straightforward. And I still actually haven't managed to trace where the variation first occurred. But I understand from the Fan UK project that it is a variant of Caldicott, but I haven't actually managed to make the link myself, which is a little bit disappointing at the moment. But I did wonder whether I would contact the research team from that project and see how they actually have made that conclusion and then see if I can work on it further. A one name study for me was a process of evolution and it led to transformation. It led to me learning new methods in my genealogy and I love learning. So it's one of the things about a one name study that really attracts me because I'm growing in so much knowledge, both in methodology and in my history and um, all sorts of things, which I just love. As I said, I sit much lighter to data collection now. I'm not slaving through row upon row of spreadsheets trying to match up records and input records manually, but actually just dumping it all in and then getting back to the side of things that I really love. I am just starting my census spreadsheets at the moment. So I've done all of 1911 
and I'm halfway through 1901, only for my main variant, I have to add. I've also done the 1939 register for quite a few variants now, uh, and I'll come back to that later. For me, a one-name study and family history, for that matter, is about stories. It's about people's lives. And what gives me the buzz is discovering people's stories. And I like to share that both sort of with the people who follow my blog, but also um, with individuals who might be trying to trace their own families. So moving on to analysis and synthesis, this is where I think for me, the spreadsheets do um, hold value as a tool. I work through family reconstruction through my software and I enter everybody into my software, regardless of whether they're attached to a family or not. So I have got a lot of singletons and unless I can prove that somebody is definitely a match to somebody I have already got in my database and be fairly confident that they are the same person, I will add them as two separate people initially until I get proved otherwise. And I find it much easier to merge my data at that point, merge the two records rather than having made that conclusion too early on and not, and then go back to it two years later and try and work out why this person actually doesn't seem to be doing the right kinds of things or they've moved somewhere or um, they seem to be with a different person or a different family. So I tell most of my stories, like I've mentioned, on my blog. This is a picture of my website. I'm sorry it's a little bit small, but it gives you an idea of um, the latest story that I've been able to tell. I've been working on some coldy cots in Rugby, which is my local town, and I also happen to work at the library there, which makes it nice and easy for um, trying to research. And I came across this photo in our archives of a man called John Alexander Coldicott. Um, and he has a very interesting story, which contains probably some post-traumatic stress from being involved in the Crimean War and the Indian Mutiny. And he came from quite a well-to-do family and there's quite a bit of scandal in there. So it was a very nice, juicy little item to research and then retell. And I got a lot of positive feedback on my Facebook group from that particular biography. So data set. I tend to choose the data sets that I work on based on the clues that they're going to give me. So I like the census records because they're great for family reconstruction. But like I said, I also like working with the 1939 register. I particularly like it because it's uh, it gives us an insight into the 20th century, which is great. I mean, the 1911 census is great, but that's very early on. And to have something that's a little bit later is really useful. I like the fact that it gives us really detailed job uh, and occupation titles, which can often be interesting. And I also like the fact that as, we, as it was a living document, that women's names were changed over time. So you can find out who they married and add in, you know, husbands or, or at least married names, which give you a clue as to who they later went on to marry. So I, I like working with that. I think you need to keep your data collection manageable. And I think if data collection is what floats your boat, then that's fantastic. But if it is a means to an end, then keep it manageable and focus on it as a tool not and not allow yourself to get bogged down by it. I think when you're starting a new study, it can feel incredibly daunting. Um, you know that it's a, it's a lifelong thing and that's OK. But then I don't know about you, but I kind of want to progress and I, I want to discover you know more um, all the time and there is just isn't enough time to do that and it you know it can feel a little frustrating at times and you hear people other guild members who have been doing it for a long time who have got tens of thousands of people in their database and it can it can feel a little overwhelming but it's it's working out how you do your study and how you keep it manageable and not getting bogged down by large quantities of data so focusing on the end result has what's helped me 
continue and not, I suppose, feel disheartened at times. I focus on that individual person and that way I can see that to a conclusion, whether that is just studying that person's life or whether it's actually, you know, working the family back as far as I can and forwards as far as I can, you know, depending on whether what size project I want to engage in and, and how interesting the, the family is as a whole. Having said all of that, though, I think the spreadsheets are useful in doing this analysis and giving us those clues to the origins of our surname or the origins of a variant of our surname. Location analysis is, is something I've done. I haven't done a great deal of different types of analysis, but like I said, I have worked with the 1939 register for quite a few variants. And although that is a very up-to-date record base, it does still actually indicate where the, um, or certainly for mine, where the origins of my variants are, even though you would think that by 1939 people are hugely mobile. What I found instantly from studying that data set was that the Coldicots with an eye were very much surrounding the, the central counties, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, Gloucestershire, and the Caldicots with an E were completely different. They didn't have a great population in those areas, but were very much based Cheshire, Lancashire way. And that was quite surprising to me that that would show up even on such a modern data set. So I published that location analysis onto my blog. I tend to, I show the most popular counties and then I break down the most popular counties into the most popular cities and towns where those people were from and that's something that I want to continue doing for all the variants but I've only done for a few so far. Publicising and publishing, now again like family reconstruction this was always my intention right from when I started my study. It's very much a raison d'etre really for my, for my one name study and it's very important to me. So my purpose has always been to share. I've always wanted to work with other people. I've always wanted to be able to understand more about other people's pedigrees and their own family histories and to be able to share what I've discovered and to tell people stories. And sometimes what I found is that those stories have been familiar to some people or the people themselves have been familiar to people that I'm in contact with. And then other times, nobody's known anything about this particular person. And I wonder sometimes whether there are any people out there who know that person's story anymore. And I think it's really important so that these stories don't get forgotten to keep telling them. And I love that sense of community. I love being able to do some research. I, li I like researching on my own and I like to work through my one name study in my own way, but I do like the interaction that I get from other people who are interested in the surname. Again, it gives me a little bit of um, a sense of achievement when I've been able to share a story and people have enjoyed it and appreciated it. So the methods that I publicize my one name study through the Guild profile is the main thing that I started off doing. And, and it took me a while when I, I registered my study and didn't set up my profile for several months. And it wasn't until I went to the last Who Do You Think You Are exhibition and I met some goons at the Guild of One Name Studies stand and they said, you really need to do your profile. It's, it's a great thing. Um, it's a great launch pad, actually, for your study and for people to, to discover your study. And even if you don't know very much about your study at this stage, don't worry, just put in a small amount and then you can keep adjusting it as your study grows. So I took that on board and um, set up a very basic profile, which I have adjusted a little bit as I've got to know more, but it still only contains a small amount of information at the moment. And then another main um, way that I publish my study is through my website, like I said, and I set that up sometime last year, late last year, and set it up through WordPress because I'd been used to WordPress. I used to blog in a different sphere and had always used WordPress. So 
and I liked the look of it. Actually, it was through the Pharaoh's course again that I learned of the benefits of having TNG as a website as well. Up until this point, I hadn't actually been able to share my data. So I could share stories about individuals, but I didn't know how to share the pedigrees or the trees that I was building and wanted to be able to do that. And so Julie and some other members of the Guild explained to me that I would be able to do the, do the two things combined, WordPress and TNG. And with the help of Chris Gray and Paul Featherstone, I was able to do that. And they set me up and it was much easier than I was expecting. And I really love the fact that now behind that WordPress site, just by accessing the toolbar at the top, you can enter into my data and you can have a look at some of the pedigrees and the trees, which will hopefully help people with their own research. I have also just set up links within the biographies to all the individuals in the TNG part of my website. So if a person's name is mentioned, then you can click on that name and that link will take you straight to their record in the TNG part of the website too. Um, my Facebook group, I started not long after I started the website because I wanted a way of generating interest in the website and to start connecting with people who were interested in the surname. And I didn't really know how to start um, gaining members of my group. I tried through Ancestry to so I looked at people who were researching the surname and contacted them and told them about my group. And, I, and I've got a few people who have joined that way. And I also went through by searching Facebook itself and just searching Facebook uh, for people with the surname. So they weren't even necessarily interested in their family history, to my knowledge, and just messaged them. You, you can message anyone in Facebook. You don't have to be friends with them. You can only do them in small batches because Facebook will sort of punish you <laughs> if you um, do too many because it thinks you're spamming people. But so what I did was just every day I would do a small amount, sort of 10, 15 people. And I got quite a lot of people joining my group from that as well. And then over the last few months, I've had individuals joining one useful way of, of getting new members for my group was to search the Ancestry forum on Facebook. Um, there's an Ancestry UK group that I have um, been part of for some time and I searched through the comments on that group or the posts on that group for anybody who had posted anything to do with my surname and found a couple and of course they, and they were really interested in joining the Caldecott Facebook group. So that's been a useful method of gaining new members. And I think I'm on about 56 members at the moment. And it's a really nice little community who actually contribute themselves as well. So I've learned new things through it, which has been brilliant. I've been working over the last few weeks to publish, publicize my blog and the stories on my blog more. I, I wanted to expand my readership beyond just those who were particularly linked to the Caldecott surname um, because I felt that that might be too narrow a niche to really gain enough sort of Google clout and momentum for my website. And through publishing some of the stories about the Caldecott, Caldecott family in rugby. As I was a member of a local group on Facebook about the history of rugby, it suddenly occurred to me that I could post the story about you know, this man on, on that group. And that has boosted my website hits tremendously. And I've started doing it in other areas as well. There were a large amount, a, lot, a family based in Gainsborough um, whom I posted several posts about a few months ago. And so I re, so I posted those just recently on the Gainsborough History Facebook group. And again, got a lot of interest and actually gained another couple of photos to add to my collection that were relevant to the study. So that was brilliant. So what I found is if you search Facebook for a town that you know, is particularly popular in your study or relevant to your study and looking for words like past and present or history 
or uh, memories, then you can usually come up with some lo some local groups and they, if you join them, are often quite open to you posting useful information about individuals or things that are relevant to that particular place. Like I say, I have used Ancestry to try and connect with people. I must admit, I don't get much fruit from Ancestry. I find it a bit of a strange social media. If it, I mean, it isn't really that. That's not its main purpose. And I find that when you are engaged in conversation with people through their messaging system, that conversation doesn't really go very far. I've messaged a lot of people and not got any replies. And sometimes when people have messaged me, I've replied and not had any response from them so I've asked them something or I've given them a piece of information and then the conversation just goes dry. I think that's a shame because I think there's more potential to have a little bit more of a dialogue but that's just the way it seems to be. I will still keep publicising my study through Ancestry and I do message people who have got pedigrees that are of the surnames that I'm looking at but it doesn't really seem to produce many followers. The last thing that I've done to publicise my study is that there are a few people now that are sort of semi-famous that I have written biographies about myself. Randolph Caldicott was a famous artist and children's illustrator and Alfred James Caldicott was a famous composer and they had Wikipedia pages that had been set up by other people. But you can edit any Wikipedia page. So I have gone on to those pages and added a link to my relevant blog pages at the bottom and I have also gone into the Wikipedia page on the Caldicott surname just the general one about the surname itself and added my one name study website at the bottom so that has generated some interest as well. As I say I think it's a journey a one name study um, we learn along the way I hope that even when I've been doing it 20 years I'm still learning along the way um, because that's generally my approach to life anyway. And I think, like I said, it, it can be disheartening, particularly when you're at the start of a one name study. But the best thing to do is to observe and not compare. Learn what you can from those who are more experienced and observe what they do that's good, what you could transfer to your study because they work in a similar way to you, how you would do things differently. But don't compare and see it as a race and you're right near the start line and they're towards the finish line because I just think that it's very easy to become overwhelmed. Where can we get help? Well I've got help from the Guild Wiki site which has been really useful. Webinars, um, I've listened to most of them from this year and I think there's been a really really useful addition to what the Guild offers particularly for new people. I've read the Seven Pillars book which has been again invaluable um, it's a real manual for you when you're starting out and you think ah, what next what do I do and like I said I've done the beginners pharaohs course in one name studies and I've now done the advanced one as well and have got a lot out of those and particularly enjoyed meeting and chatting with other goons so what are my aims for next on in my one name study well I want to continue working through the core data sets, particularly the censuses, and um, at least nail those for my main variants. I want to continue growing the community in my Facebook group and those that read my blog. And I want to go to a Goons conference. I would have really liked to have gone to it this year, but um, it didn't work for one reason or another, but I would really like to go and meet some of the people that I um, know the names of, know their studies, have seen them speak on webinars and just spend some time learning from each other. As I say, as a one-name study, we, I would say we are researchers, you know, and we are involved in a lot of research in different areas, facts, figures, history, methodology, sociology, you name it, we seem to cover it. And that is an important skill set that we need for a one name study. But for me, the biggest part of what I do is being a storyteller. And I hope that as I continue in my one name study, I can share the stories of lots of Caldicotts who have lived along the way and measures who um, 
you know, I, I need to get onto at some point. And if I can juggle the two one name studies and my own family history, I will be happy. But I, I think storytelling is what makes a one name study for me. And that's what's important. And I just wanted to finish with something that um, my husband said recently, because I'm always sharing little nuggets about Caldicott's to him. And obviously it's his family name because it's my married name. And um, he says that what he loves is the fact that I just share a little bit of a story to him. I might say, oh, this person was really interested because they died in a, an interesting way or they traveled a lot or whatever. And um, and he, he said that's what's interesting to him. He said when we're in the middle of our one name study, um, we we obviously see all the data and we see all the detail and we live and breathe it. And maybe we're a strange kind of breed of people, but it's not necessarily what everybody else is interested in. And if we can summarize some of the interesting aspects of our study and the interesting characters that we encounter through the stories that we can tell, then lots of people will be interested. I can guarantee because lots of people are interested in stories. And that's it. Excellent presentation. That was fascinating. And I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is ask you a few questions uh, while I have you here, because as I mentioned to people before, this was pre-recorded, your section of it. Um, first of all, I wanted to know what type of software did you use for your location analysis? Uh, just Excel. No, well, it wasn't Excel, actually. I used LibreOffice, but yeah, just spreadsheets. So you gathered the data yourself, all of those numbers, and, and put it in? You didn't use something like Surname Atlas or um, World Profiler or anything like that to get your data? That's correct, yeah. I've only presented them as bar charts, um, not within a map at the moment. So I just literally used the pivot table kind of filtering system that you can use in a spreadsheet to narrow down all the different locations and count, work out the, the county analysis really for the UK. Okay, that's great to know. Uh, you mentioned pivot tables and I use Excel a lot, so I'm familiar with that. So you're able to take the data that you've put into a spreadsheet, whatever version, you know, format you use, mm -hmm. and, and by looking at the location information that was gainable from that census or whatever else information, you're able to get those locations. I think that's important for people to know that they don't necessarily have to be using other software as well. That's great. Mm. Um, now you said that you have this uh, Facebook page that you use and I, ha I have visited it and I was just wondering since you have uh, you know about 60 members in your Facebook group and it's a closed group mm. how much do you rely on posts from others and how much are posts by you if you had to break that down in percentages do you think you do the majority of the posts or is it you know 75% uh, 25% or, or what? Yeah, I definitely do the majority. It's probably about 85% me and maybe 15% others. Then because they're a mixture of people who do do their own research. And then there's a lot of people who who I just contacted because they were Caldicott's. They had the surname. Um, they don't necessarily have a great deal to share, although some people have sort of said, oh, my granddad was or and I've, I've tried to sort of promote discussion at times, although people don't seem to want to share too much. But going back to what you just said about it being a closed group, that was really based on what my the members of my group wanted. I originally started with it being open, thinking that that might draw more people to it. But actually, a couple of members said that they wouldn't share if that would appear as a public post that anybody could view, um, but would be happy to tell some of their own family history stories with to a small audience. So that was why I made it a closed group. I think that's important for people to think about when they're setting up Facebook groups, you know, whether it's closed, open or secret and, and kind of knowing how Facebook treats it and who can see it because I would agree that I'm in a number of closed groups where people are very willing to share photos and, and have them shared among the people and then with permission use it elsewhere or ask questions or tell stories that they might not want to get out to everyone. It also saves you if you're in a closed group from a lot of the 
um, companies or people who are who are trying to leverage your Facebook group for themselves um, mm -hmm. being involved. It gives you less less uh, editing or cleaning up to do when you know that you know it's a group of people that you know. So I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, about how much time did you spend just in round numbers uh, mm -hmm. to come up with your website? And I know you had a knowledge already of WordPress. To set it up initially, not very long at all. I, I probably, it took me well, less, less than a day. I browsed through a number of themes before I found one that I was happy with and one that I, I felt was suitable for the area um, of historical studies and really didn't, you know, that was probably the most time that I spent. And then just sort of making that front page look pretty and having the the widgets on the sidebar, the links to my Facebook page and um, uh, being able to message me and email me if they wanted to ask a question and that kind of thing. Um, so probably less than a day to set it up initially. And then, you know, that's evolved as I then added on TNG, which, which as I said, to be honest, most of the work for that was done for me. So that was that was easy. And that's some um, that's a helpful benefit of um, using a guild hosted TNG website is that you get, I, I would say, as much or as little hand holding as well as tutorials and other information that you need. Now, you talked about the initial setup about how much time do you spend a week on your one name study, whether that's doing your research, your analysis or sharing that information on your website? Um, yeah, it's every day, Tessa, really. I, I work part time um, because I have a chronic illness, so I'm not really able to um, be quite as active as I would like. But I do find that when I'm uh, resting, in inverted commas, I tend to like to keep my brain occupied. So I'm often sort of sitting on the settee with my laptop. So every certainly every morning when I, I'm an early riser, and so I will spend time on my one name study pretty much every morning. And then if if I'm around in the daytime while the children are at school, then I will do some more during the day. I tend to fade towards the end of the day, so I don't tend to be much very productive in the evenings. But on a weekly basis, I will spend a lot of hours, probably too many hours, my husband would say. But yeah. Once I heard that you worked part time and I think it is you have three children that you keep up with and and you're um, at home working because I think every wife and mother is working at home. I just thought, how does she get this all in? And I felt a little bit like I was falling behind, but it was good to hear from you that I should observe but not compare myself. It makes me feel better. I really appreciate the fact that you went through the seven pillars approach because that's what we've been doing in this webinar series and i think for most members if some have been in for a long time or have been at conferences or watched the recordings of the conference sessions or whatever they have a better sense but i think when you're just starting out most of my american members that tends to be the the big question how do i get started there's almost a paralysis because mm. there's you're overwhelmed by the amount of information and you just basically from what you're saying is taking it one step at a time and just working through those steps realizing that you're you're basically hopping around on each of those pillars you're not you're not you know um, climbing a mountain so to speak mm. so first i want to thank melanie for presenting today we all feel a bit overwhelmed when starting or restarting a one name study and there are so many approaches and focuses for our research our record keeping and our methodology for our one name studies as well as our family history perhaps what you've heard and seen today gets you thinking beyond your current practices Second, I want to thank Guild member Kim Baldacino, who, in addition to working on her own studies, has served as our webmaster for the past four years. During this time, we had a major overhaul of our website, both in front of and behind the scenes, and Kim has been a driving force for our website entering the 21st century. Kim has gone out of her way to help the marketing action team by answering questions, providing guidance, and patiently explaining the process for getting our webinar series up and running on the Guild website. I, for one, am going to miss her kind, thoughtful, and always calm, no matter how stressed I get. 
Assistance. It takes a lot of volunteer time and effort to provide the various services and benefits to Guild members, and our website is our public face to the online world. We appreciate all of our volunteers on the website team for their efforts. Now a reminder that our next webinar is on Tuesday, August 21st at 7 p.m. British Summer Time, and that should show up on the GoToWebinar platform adjusted for the time on your computer. Our topic for the August seminar is My Italian Surname Study. This will be a great opportunity to learn about a one-name study that doesn't have its basis or origin in the UK, and many of our newer members and studies fit this description. Michael Cassara and Julie Goucher are going to discuss how they approach a study that incorporates foreign records, a few foreign languages, a completely different culture, and in most cases, different church records and government records. While their focus is on an Italian one-name study, the concept applies equally to any non-UK one-name study. Thanks so much for watching this pre-recorded session. I hope you get the opportunity to watch the live or recorded session by Karen Heenan-Davis, and then we'll see you back here in August.